evening and welcome to the new school. I'm Claire Oney, Director of the Vera Lee Center for Urban Politics, and delighted to present to you tonight's program called Unsung Key for Building and Blending Pop and Scene. It's um, our first event in this new academic year, and particularly um, uh, uh, appropriate one in many ways. One is the format, because it is a true collaboration. And I'd like to acknowledge foremost the opportunities of Harvard and the Art Museum and its director, Harry Bickle, to meet here. We've also worked in indirect ways, I guess, with one university, and Andreas Christian, professor of um, comparative literature, is representing Columbia here tonight. And then, of course, there are independent voices that we're always relying on, and I'm going to call them the table tonight. Um, in terms of topic, it's the few artists who are more prominent at this point, and I'm so people with his references and incorporations of um, aesthetic symbols associated with Nazi Germany is perhaps amongst the most, the most controversial. And that combination, again, is something that we're striving for in all of our programs. So I'm very proud and pleased to have um, Lovich and um, his, his distinguished panel with us tonight. Um, I'd like to acknowledge them. I'd also like to acknowledge the support of the Institute. And of course, the New School, I'd like to thank my uh, colleagues in various departments. Before I hand this over to Laura Kaufman, um, Curator of Education at the Orange Museum, I'd like to point out that we have two more events coming out this week. On Thursday, a lecture by Professor Bernstein on the public domain and the long tradition of the New School um, dealing with the public sphere. And then we're working with the Lone Hand Cultural Council this weekend on a series of panel discussions and lectures and conferences called um, Cities Art and Recovery on the page of 9-11, but a few days later and looking back and in the future. So I hope you'll join us for some of these events, but first of all, thank you very much for being here tonight.
the key for civilians that Feather Talk uh, works, which you'll see momentarily. I have been called the curator of this exhibition, and in a way that's kind of a misnomer. I think the more construction manager uh, is a better term, which you'll see when we begin. Um, Okay, um, this is Anselm Keeper uh, in the uh, pavilion with the inscription on the wall, and I will come back to all of these things as we go along. The pavilion uh, was originally built on Keeper's property in Barshoff in southern France uh, in 2004. Keeper uh, created all of the paintings, there are 30 paintings. And in 2005, the pavilion was replicated. In other words, a replica of the building was erected in Hoxton Square in London. And uh, it was on view there for a month. There is Kiefer uh, at the opening. You can get some sense of the scale of the paintings uh, in the view behind him. Shortly after the show was finished, uh, the pavilion began to be deconstructed. You can see the uh, cladding, which is metal cladding that Kiefer put a patina on uh, to age coming off. And uh, beneath that cladding is a steel framework. You can see the big double doors there. Um, all of this material, there is the steel framework that the pavilion is built out of. All of this material was loaded up onto trucks uh, and was put into containers. The containers were shipped uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, they arrived in Ridgefield, Connecticut at the Aldrich Museum. That's our building in the background. In the spring of this year, and we began construction uh, at that time. You can see the concrete footings being poured. Uh, you can get a sense of where the pavilion is located uh, behind our museum, the sculpture garden to the rear of the museum. A little bit different locale than either Barshock or Hoskins Square. Um, there's the footings upon which the building is built. Steel framework uh, reconstructed and the uh, interior cladding put back up. You can see in the middle of that image the skylight, uh, the opening that forms the skylight. The pavilion is primarily lit by daylight. Here is the pavilion from our building, and you can see the paintings being loaded into the pavilion. Each painting came in a travel crate, or travel frame, I should say. Um, here are paintings inside the pavilion. You can see that device that we uh, kind of cobbled together to move the paintings around. They're enormously heavy. And here is a label on the back of one of the paintings. Why am I showing you a label on the back of the painting? Because it says, eight inch protrusion of assemblage. Uh, and I love that phrase. Um, in other words, it gives the dimension of the painting and then the fact that there are protrusions that stick out eight inches, and this is one of those protrusions, um, which is to say a submarine. And the 30 paintings have, I believe, 27 shifts. I'd have to go back and, and double check that, but let's say about 27 shifts. They are made out of lead, that is sheet lead, and they are hung on wires. You can actually see the wires that are supporting the, the ships. Here is another one of the submarines. Uh, you can also get a sense of the surface of the paint on these works. A acid was applied to the lead to give it the patina that you see. Again, close up one of the ships with the crackled paint behind. Here's another one of the ships. Um, this one is upside down. And here are the paintings being lifted and put into place. Uh, basically, we had a, a mechanical lift with a little apparatus, this um, screw to the back frame of the painting, and then you could lift it up and drop it onto the stretcher, onto the um, bracket on the wall, and then the device was taken off. You can see that the paintings go three high. Uh, they also go five across, so there are 15 paintings on each wall. Um, there's a very small gap between each painting, so it's very it's difficult to, to install the paintings. You can see also there are light bulbs hanging from the ceiling. Uh, there is a little bit of artificial light available, but Keeper's intention was that the paintings be primarily seen with natural daylight. So on a bright sunny day, you get a very different effect than on a cold rainy day. Here is the completed pavilion. Uh, you can see the relationship between the pavilion and the Aldrich 
uh, permanent building. <coughs> there it is behind the building. It senses the scale of the location. Again, looking back up towards our building. People going in. The massive front doors. The doors are 18 feet high. When the pavilion is open to the public, the doors are kept open unless it's pouring with rain. And this is the finished view inside with viewers to give you some sense of, of scale again. This is the left wall. 15 paintings on the left wall, 15 <coughs> paintings on the right wall. So the two long walls contain the paintings. The back wall has an inscription which uh, is written in Kiefer's hand, and this is a um, rather unpoetic translation of the inscription. It is, um, Kiefer based this work on the work of Belmir Klebnikov, who was a Russian uh, early 20th century poet, who had this uh, doctrine of war, this theory that uh, climactic naval battles happened every 317 years, or multiples thereof. The last one, uh, you can all rest easy, the last one was 1905 when Russia and Japan fought. <coughs> we have a ways to go. Um, the inscription uh, carries on into the paintings as well. This is again Keeper's hand, uh, close up detail of the hair written in uh, charcoal on the surface of the painting. And you can see here on this painting uh, much more writing across the top. The writing in this case refers to uh, Klebnikov's theories and to particular battles, um, different um, episodes of war and the calculations uh, around that, you know, with the multiplication of 317. You can see here again the lead shift on the surface with the writing, some of the math, 634 being 317 times 2. Again, uh, more writing relating to those theories. And also, in some of the paintings, uh, the ships are set in the context of what appear to be nets or perhaps star charts. And those are actually thin pieces of string, or in some cases, leather, um, stretched between actual screws or nails, which are protruding from the surface of the canvas. Uh, in this case, you can see not only is there a ship, there's also a barbed wire. And you'll see the phrase Odi Navali, which is Italian for naval odes, which uh, runs through a number of the paintings. Here is a close-up detail of one of the ships with the thin strips of leather wrapped around it. Again, the antenna motif, which shows up in many of the paintings, uh, which is again a reference to Klebnikov and his theories of uh, language, universal language being able to be apprehended through radio waves. So a number of these ships have these kind of radio antennas on them. This is the painting that we just saw the, the close-up detail of. Odi Navalny, again. Another thing that occurs, another uh, couple of motifs that appear in this work are sunflowers. These are actual sunflowers, dry sunflowers covered in white paint. So they are, you know, approximately three across. And in the upper left is written in Aphrodite. Uh, Aphrodite appears in a number of these works, uh, as well as Hero and Leander. You have to look closely to see it in the slide. It's a little more difficult than in real life. But in that blob, if you will, on the left is the word hero, and on the right is Leander. Hero, Leander, and Aphrodite were all warships of the Second World War, uh, as well as obviously being uh, Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And Hero was a handmaiden to Aphrodite, and Leander was her lover. So there's a kind of subtext of uh, veiled eroticism running through this work, um, kind of hidden below. So you have the war theories of Klebnikov, you have actual ships from the First and Second World War, and you also have Greek mythology all tied in together within the work. And after that sprint through our pavilion, I'd now like to introduce Mark Rosenthal, who will talk a little bit more uh, slowly. <laughs>
to see the show in Richfield, it was a big surprise in a lot of ways because uh, one's normal experience of a Kiefer painting is the standard painting of a painting like this. Uh, each painting is normally gigantic. And one takes in uh, something that vaguely suggests a kind of history or a narrative, certainly a subject but one stands in front of a single painting. What was so different and intriguing to me was to see this installation, this group of paintings, because it presents Kiefer in a very different way, uh, albeit continuing his normal approach. Instead of standing in front of one painting, one stood in front of uh, 30 paintings, which all together represent a single work of art. Um, so in other words, one is being enveloped by a keeper in a way that one isn't normal. Normally, no matter how big a painting by keeper is, uh, you uh, have a kind of distance in relation to this single canvas. But in this installation, keeper succeeds in surrounding you all together. Um, that decision by Kiefer, to me, uh, immediately uh, triggered thoughts about the phenomenon of installation art, which is so much with us now. Um, and it seemed to me that Kiefer, in a certain way, was engaging in the tradition of installation art. Uh, just briefly, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with installation work, uh, that's a term that refers to a single work of art that fills an entire room. And by filling an entire room, the frame becomes the walls of the space. And in fact, instead of the viewer sort of observing what's happening inside a framed object, one is now within the frame. Uh, this is the effect of installation art. Most often with contemporary installations, uh, they consist of objects, videos, all kinds of things. Not necessarily paintings, in other words. When one is in an installation, we're very much the way one is in this great uh, assemblage of Kiefer paintings. Uh, the viewer circumnavigates the room, walks slowly past each of these things, and is really in the work of art. Right? Keep repeating that, but that is the profound feeling that one experiences. And as one experiences that, I find as a viewer that I'm very aware of myself in the space. In other words, again, the normal perception of a work of art in the space of the work of art is separate from us, the viewers. But when you're walking around an installation, you are in the room. You are in, you are in the work of art physically. You're also in the work of art in terms of time because your experience in the work of art becomes crucial. So you're very much aware of yourself viewing such an installation. Meanwhile, though, as a result of this sense of oneself inside the work of art, a funny kind of um, aspect develops in installation, as well as in the Kiefer, and I'll be returning to this, namely that there's a kind of realism about this experience. Uh, realism is obviously a difficult and complicated word in, in art history, but uh, there's a reality to our experience in the installation that isn't like any other experience of the work of art. And Kiefer has chosen now, at least on occasion, to put his paintings into this very large frame. Finally, uh, the phenomenon of installation, of course, recalls uh, the phenomenon called the Gesamtkunst there, uh, the, the German concept of the total work of art. Uh, when that term was originally applied. It, it suggested that all senses were engaged. Certainly not taste is engaged, but for those of you who've been to this exhibition or have been to any future exhibition, the sense of smell is very powerful. 
the Kiefer exhibition, the smell of the painting. And in terms of our senses vis-a-vis -vis this comes there, we're very aware of ourself. It's a very sensual kind of experience, uh, these Gesamtkunst there. Finally, uh, or an installation, finally by uh, expanding even beyond the normal size painting into a room like this, uh, the viewer, I think, very often has that sense of the sublime, the work of art is so huge, and the fact that these are, in fact, seascapes only adds to that idea of our smallness vis-a-vis -vis the largeness of the, uh, the uh, phenomenon we're observing. So it creates that kind of awe-inspiring feeling that is very much what the Gesamtkunstwerk is. Finally, uh, with installations, and again, I'm emphasizing this because I think Kiefer is thinking about, in a sense, ways to expand his work. Uh, he's embraced one of the key aspects of an installation, namely site specificity. In other words, as Harry showed us, he first conceived the paintings for this building in the town of Barjon in France, and then when asked to repeat the, the grouping, he insisted that the building be recreated, which was done. And of course, asked to recreate it again, or asked to show his paintings again, he would only agree to such a thing if the space was exactly the same as originally conceived. So this is the artist controlling, and controlling this very, uh, expansive and complicated experience uh, in the form of an installation. So on one hand, I see Kiefer kind of competing with one of the prevailing and predominant uh, phenomena going on right now in contemporary art, namely installation. But there aren't so many painting installations that one thinks of, except from history. In history, you have lots of painting installations because, in fact, uh, many painters in the Renaissance Baroque period were engaged to do installation works. This is what they were doing. And, of course, this is uh, Giotto's utterly fantastic uh, Arena Chapel, Arena Chapel. I always like to put in a commercial for the Arena Chapel if you're ever on the train from Milan to Venice, you must get off of Padua and you must see this because it's really one of the greatest art experiences there is. Well, Giotto was engaged to fill a room. The room was given to him. Um, and then it was his job to create paintings having to do with the life and death of Christ. Uh, a very similar kind of physical uh, job is what Kiefer had to do. Except that with Giotto, there was a story to tell. Because we're dealing with a period when very few people read. There were practically no books, except those giant uh, books of hours and things like that. So Giotto was given a job to do, namely to be very specific in the storytelling. And I don't have uh, slides of the individual tales, but you know what I mean. Uh, Christ carrying the cross, so on and so forth. Each, each story needed to be told. And so there was tremendous ambition in the telling of these stories in the same way that Michelangelo uh, had to do with his Sistine ceiling. Um, at this point in time, it was necessary for a painter to give a very complicated narrative. Uh, where it was hired to paint the very complicated narrative. The artist is working with a given space and then is conceiving how to tell the story. So Michelangelo put the last judgment at the end, put scenes leading up to the last judgment along the side. These are examples then of installations from history that Kiefer, who is a very educated and canny person, certainly knows about. Uh, this is uh, one of the Monet water lily cycles from the Orangerie in Paris. 
And we see a different time and a different place in terms of this kind of ambitious painting uh, and certainly a different kind of job in mind. Monet's job isn't to tell that kind of story, to tell uh, any sort of literary story. Uh, for him, the, the artist is thinking more of a kind of all over effect, a kind of synesthetic mood, just simply creating an atmosphere that surrounds the viewer in a certain way and creating a singular impact, an impact that uh, is carried forth through the, the series of paintings which in fact relate to each other and connect to each other in very subtle ways. This is all a, a more modern concept about installation and about taking a room and filling it because to some extent the walls dissolve much more than they did with the Giotto and the Michelangelo. Uh, the space sort of becomes the pictorial expanse. Well, these ambitions about painting, about installation, have come and gone uh, or have converged at different times, even in the relatively recent past. This, of course, is as the label shows you, Barnett Newman Stations of the Cross. And uh, this is a wonderful uh, series to experience because it also uh, engages the viewer in that quality I, I called serving navigation. When you walk around the room with the Stations of the Cross, uh, well, when you first walk into the room, you get this <coughs> effect of the ensemble, a series of paintings all the same size, except for one that isn't, excuse me, isn't appearing in this picture. Um, and then you start to traverse the room. You're now in the aura of Barnett Newman. He's controlling your experience in the room. But then as you walk from painting to painting, you are experiencing an abstract vocabulary at work, changing the, uh, the proportions and the events, the pictorial events that are going on there. Albeit that Barnett Newman called this series the Stations of the Cross, no less. So he is referencing a kind of narrative, and he's uniting a narrative uh, in a very vague way, really, with uh, this pictorial experience. This is a confused image on the screen. Um, the picture at the top, the black and white picture, is showing you what's seen in color. Uh, the, two, uh, the two registers below the top one, in other words, are showing you the paintings that fill the space by uh, James Rosenquist, the famous F-111. And you see another uh, artist of recent vintage, he's alive, of course, uh, taking on the idea of an ambitious painting, painting that fills a space. Uh, in his case, uh, it's not telling a story. It's, again, it's very much, in a way, it's uh, <coughs> an exaggeration to say perhaps, but it's a little bit like the Monet in the sense that it's about an atmosphere, it's about a milieu, uh, namely the era of the pop period and the celebration of that form of love. This is a series, you're not seeing the whole room. Um, there's a pair of paintings on the left and right that you're not seeing as well as a painting that introduces this room. This is a fantastic group of paintings in Philadelphia by Cy Twombly called 50 Days of Dealing. Uh, Twombly is an interesting figure vis-a-vis -vis Kiefer and a number of contemporary painters. Um, Kiefer reveres Twombly and Twombly uh, of course, as an artist who has been very interested in engaging with history, historical subjects of all kinds, but also Twombly on several occasions has done these big suites of paintings, which ostensibly have to do with a story, the story of 50 Days at Union. Uh, but 
uh, the story is told in a very kind of episodic way. If it's being told at all, it's really a kind of pictorial and explosive uh, kind of telling of a story. I think, um, well, Twombly makes great use of language and numbers in a kind of uh, crazy sort of fashion. Qualities that Kiefer made use of very often in his own work. Well, just before Kiefer made this series that we see in uh, Ridgefield, he did another series. And the other series he did in the year 2000, I believe it was the first time he did a series. It was done for a church in Paris, and it consists of six paintings. But each painting is 30 feet high um, and about 10 feet wide. And so that, in a certain way, it's hard to call it a warm-up for this, but in between that and this series, it demonstrates that Kiefer is now very interested in engaging uh, himself with this tradition, both the tradition of installation as well as um, uh, historical ambitious paintings, series of paintings. And uh, it's just a kind of question to me, I mean, because I haven't talked to Kiefer about this, but what I do wonder about is a couple of things in terms of his addressing of this sort of thing. Uh, First of all, it's often said that Kiefer's a kind of history painter, which is as much as one should say in terms of is he a history painter or isn't he a history painter. He alludes to that. But uh, more importantly, I think Kiefer uh, is interested in history and is interested in creating an impact in each of his works that relates to uh, historical and literary themes that are of interest to him. And what he's clearly doing by uh, taking on this kind of approach with installations is attempting to give these themes far greater immediacy, far more power, far more uh, kind of visceral, creating more of a visceral and emotional reaction on the part of the viewer which has always been his uh, aim, is to make an emotional kind of art. This is very much what a key for a painting is and what the art is like. And now I think we see him attempting to do that in a new way that he hadn't done before. So thank you. Both 
had quite a hold over the German artistic imagination. Kiefer must have come to know Plevnikov through that edition, and in a way it may be significant that his most recent work goes back to that earlier moment in time. Plevnikov, History and the Sea, rather than that work of the 90s, the Cosmos, the Pyramids, or the Kabbalah. My argument is quite simple. I think that in this project, Kiefer picks up threads of his earlier work, but develops them in new ways and in line with the changed intellectual and political culture of the later decades. And yet, the reference to Plevnikov's bizarre doctrine of naval battles remains puzzling. The doctrine that naval battles occur in history every 317 years, or multiples thereof, is just plain cookie. <laughs> Plevnikov himself actually disavowed it in a letter to Mikhail Matyushin on December 17, 1914. We should not assume that Kiefer gives us the between any credence whatsoever. We know how the pre-revolutionary symbolists in Russia were fascinated by the materiality of numbers and of letters, and Klevnikov himself was a ferocious Greco-maniac. Letters and numbers were endowed with deeper meaning to be unlocked by the artist. Kiefer, of course, has always had a penchant for deeper meanings. But what makes him into such an accomplished uh, artist is something else, I think. That is his obsession with the sensuous materiality of the medium. And I think Mark has talked about this aspect as well. <clears throat> his is not painting with a brush, but with a spatula, creating protrusions, plastering and accumulating, and shoving and pushing and lifting stuff, paint and other matter, onto the work over the surface of what used to be simple canvas. So while one can argue that the affinity to Klevnikov consists of both artists' insistence on the materiality of their respective medium, I think there's also something else, something perhaps more abstract, that draws Kiefer to the Russian poet. <clears throat> I would suggest that it has to do with the inscription on the front wall taken from Klevnikov, time, measure of the world, fate of the people which, by the way, is also in the original, not poetic, I mean, just straightforward and rather banal. As one reads Klevnikov's text, <coughs> entitled Time Measure of the World, it becomes clear that his doctrine of naval battles is anti-historicist in intention. In that way, he is, you know, he sides with the anti-historicism of the modernists. It is an attempt to spatialize time in order to find time's hidden laws of movement, to represent history and time in a series of axes and lines, circles and angles, rather than in simple chronology. Of course, Klevnikov does it in language, Kiefer does it in paint. Kle Klevnikov wrote in this text, and I quote, if there are two twinned concepts, they are space and time, end quote. And he goes on to explore their relationship. Kiefer, to me, has always been a painter of space and of time, a painter of landscapes, which are also mostly paintings of history. And his is the ambiguity of working between these two modes. Now, here I have a few examples from his earlier work. Mark Heath of 1974, uh, Icarus, March, Sand, 1981, uh, both paintings of the Mark Brandenburg, the site of many famous Russian battles. Here a painting entitled Your Golden Hair, Margarete, a landscape painting with a reference to Goethe's Gretchen from Faust, as well as to Celan's Margarete from the famous uh, Death View, which is a poem about the Holocaust. So references to the mythic battle landscapes of Russian history, to the Holocaust, German intellectual and literary history, of course, abounded in Kiefer's work of the 70s and the 1980s. Now, in the Klemnikov project, landscapes have become seascapes, and concrete historical references have moved to the background. And yet, as one looks at this earlier work, the parallel to the Odina Valley becomes obvious. Where the land or sea is conjured up, the chosen perspective is always that of high horizon painting. The works convey a sense of claustrophobia, no escape, 
fertility failure. Now, in other works of those early years, Kiefer had occasionally taken up the theme of the sea. First in occupations, a work from 1969 that gave him instant notoriety, a series of photographs of the artist performing the Hitler salute in empty urban or natural sites. Here, the typical kind of uh, you know, romantic government uh, of Hitler position. And here, another one from that series with Kiefer as dark, backlit figure standing seemingly on the surface of the water in a bathtub. The artist has walking on the water, but in the bathtub. An irony in what I call heroic anti-heroism of the gesture are evident. The bathtub then appears again in Operation Sea Line in 1975, a satirical tape on the Nazi plan to invade England by sea, and more generally, I would suggest, on German fantasies of naval predominance as it was rampant in Britain, mean Germany, and in the Third Reich. And Mark Rosenbaum has actually given a wonderful reading of that painting in his catalog of uh, 1988. Now, why do I show these earlier works? I would say that by comparison with his earlier work, it is striking to see that irony and satire are almost completely missing from the Ori Navali. And I've just shown two of these images now as I go on. The rusting toy ships affixed to the paintings almost get lost in the overwhelming scale of the high horizon seascapes. They suggest defeat, futility, death. The absence of any even fictional seaworthiness of those toy ships corresponds to the albatross-like groundedness of Kiefer's airplane sculptures of the early 1990s. Air, land, and sea have been constant spaces for painterly reflection in Kiefer's work. The seascapes themselves, extraordinarily powerful and dynamic, and some actually reminded me of Aubert's Normandy seascapes. They have something of the northern seas. Uh, the seascape suggests the overwhelming presence of natural space and natural time. Now, of course, one could say here that the message is an, an anti-heroic one, as in this earlier series of occupations, an anti-war message. But then the sheer repetitiveness of the motive, its cyclical framing, makes me rather think of what W.G. Seewald, without an inkling of irony, has called the natural history of destruction. Indeed, there seems to be some elective affinity between Kiefer and the late Seewald. Seewald's theme in that book, Natural History of Destruction, was the air war against German cities waged by the Royal Air Force and the US, the saturation bombing of civilian populations in World War II, which never achieved its stated purpose of deciding the war's outcome. <coughs> Now, admittedly, what I would suggest here may be a somewhat speculative argument, but it seems significant to me that Kiefer, who always paid close attention to contemporary political imaginaries in Germany, focused on the theme of repetitive and obviously non-successful sea battles in those same years in which German reflections on the air war reached fever pitch, in other words, the early years of the century. As in those German discussions, that any distinction between the bombing of Dresden and the bombing of Baghdad was erased when the second Iraq war started early in 2003, Kiefer's paintings muddle up or merge, and you can phrase it positively or negatively, muddle up or merge the relationship between myth and history. But at least he does not create a false history. The Ori Navali, if seen in this context, and become emblems for a natural history of destruction very much in Seewald's sense. <laughs> Deeper surfaces of land or sea approximate the deep melancholy of Seewald's Rings of Saturn, a book about the seascapes and landscapes of southeastern England. Kiefer and Seewald, this is another similarity, both expatriates, Seewald for most of his life in England, where he's now celebrated as an English writer, Kiefer since the 1990s in France. Both of them resuscitators of a form or a medium that had been declared dead multiple times over, painting and the novel. 
both offering a darkened view on the contemporary world, which I think resonates with many viewers and readers. Let me just say one thing in conclusion. Despite the sense of futility, decline, and destruction that Kiefer and Seewald's works project, they are saturated with aesthetic appeal, masterly execution of their craft, and sheer beauty of color, form, and in Seewald, of course, language. No doubt, some critics will accuse Kiefer of aestheticizing war, just as they have accused Bill Polsky, I think, in earlier decades of aestheticizing fascism. But that approach seems rather stale these days. If there is a message at all this work conveys, I would suggest that it is the message of the ultimate futility of sea battles and perhaps of war in general. Keeper's ships are tiny and ultimately ridiculous. The seas, by contrast, loom large, generating that sublime effect of the paintings, a romantic sublime that approaches lament <coughs> and elegy and not direct political commentary. It is not lofty and elevated, but as Harry Philbrick wrote in his catalog text, strangely and wonderfully intimate, due perhaps to a large part to the close framing of the works in their corrugated steel pavilion. Or, you know, this effect that Mark talked about of the viewer being enveloped, being surrounded by these works in the pavilion. So if you still have a chance, to go see the exhibit and haven't done it yet, do it. It's worth it. Thank you. What we're going to do now is uh, a little bit of question and answer amongst ourselves, and then we will open it to you.